Welcome to section 6.5, where we learn a ton of different formulas for applying exponential and logarithmic functions. In part one, we are focusing solely on the exponential formulas. This will be a pretty long video because we do have seven total formulas, and they are all listed here. And the first ones that we're going to look at are interest, then we'll move on to growth and decay formulas. We'll take a look at Newton's law of cooling, aka something's warming to room temperature, which we've looked at before, and also logistic growth, which has to do with population. Let's start with interest. First of all, what is interest? Interest is a particular sum of money based on the particular interest rate that either you have to pay for the privilege of borrowing money. So if you took out a loan for a school, for a car, for a house, right, like a mortgage, you have to pay a little bit more than just the principal amount that you borrowed. You, sometimes, you have to pay a little bit of interest because you borrowed that money from a bank or other lending company. In this case, though, interest might also be what the bank pays you if you put money in an account with them. So certain savings accounts will generate interest based on how much money you have in there as well as how long you keep it in there and how often it is compounded. Let's take a look at interest in the simplest terms first. So simple interest is uh, I, and it is accrued or like gained at a, an annual rate, R, and our original or initial investment is referenced as P, T is years. We have a lot of variables in all of these, so it's best that you write what each variable is. This is the way that we find interest. We multiply our principal amount, or how much you put in, times the rate, the interest rate. If the interest rate is 10%, it would be 0.1. We want to put it as a decimal. And then time in years. Then the way that we figure out how much money A we have in our account after those years is given by this formula down here. What they did is they took the initial uh, amount that you put in, P, plus the interest that you've gained or accrued, and replaced I with what it equals, PRT, so it's P plus PRT, factored out the P, and we got 1 plus RT in parentheses. So the amount in our account is P times the quantity 1 plus rate times time. That is simple interest. It's not really used that much. It's just the general formula for interest um, and how much we have based on a certain interest rate over a certain amount of time. What we really care about is compounded interest, which is much more applicable, and it's how banks do things, um, either that or compounded continuously, which we'll see next. So this is when our interest kind of resets and gains on that new amount n times per year. So a lot of times we'll see interest being compounded monthly, meaning n would be 12. Let's take a look at why a higher n value is better. Let's take a look at the scenario where we invest $100, to keep it simple, and we have an absurdly high interest rate, again, to keep it simple, of 5%. Yes, that is very high uh, in the real world. But let's say we have this scenario, and if n is 1, you know, we're not compounding at all throughout the year, just that one time. So at the end of the year, we'd have 5% more than our initial investment. That's it. It compounded one time, so it earned 5% that one time. That means that at the end of the year we're left with $105 because our initial investment was 100 Our interest ended up being $5, 5% of that. So our total at the end of the year is 105 Now, if N is 2, it gets a little more complex, but not crazy complex. That means halfway through the year, uh, we compound again. So halfway through the year, so we'll say after six months, We've only earned half of that $5 because it hasn't been the whole year. So after that six months, we've earned 2.5%, which is $2.50. So after six months, we have still our initial $100 plus that $2.50. Then where it gets interesting is after the whole year. So after six more months, we earn again 2.5%. But now we earn 2.5% on this new amount because we already compounded once. Now we're starting to earn interest on this amount. So we are going to take 2.5% of our new amount, 102.50. So I'm going to take 102.50 here in real time and multiply it by 2.5%, uh, which is 0.025. 
we are earning an interest amount now of an extra $2.56. So our total ends up being 10506 instead of just 105. Now that seems like a small difference and it is. It's only a 6 cents difference if you were to compound one time or two times throughout the year, but it just shows that the more times you compound, the more frequently you're having a higher amount that you're now earning interest on. So that's an interesting idea behind behind compound interest. Um, it just introduces N, which is how many times you're compounding per year. Common amounts is 12. It compounds monthly. So this is the formula that matters here. And compounding more times per year earns you more money at the end of that year. Let's take a look at our first example. We have $500 investing, and we're offering, this is a more realistic number for a percent. It is only 0.75%. So as a decimal, that is 0.0075. It's going to be compounded monthly, so we know that that means that n equals 12. So let's write out a couple things that we know. Number one is going to help us write that out. We want to actually write out the formula for our specific situation here. So what I did is I wrote out just the general formula just that we learned on the other slide. Now we want to fill in these blanks. So p is our initial or principal amount. So that is $500. Then it's 1 plus, and then R is the rate, which that's the rate as a uh, percentage. We want to actually write it as a decimal, like I said before. So it's 0 0.0075. So that's really what you have to be careful about. A lot of students will mess that up, and they'll write it as just 0 0.75. So just be careful. Then N is how many times we compound per year. We identified that N is 12. And then t is actually going to be the variable that we keep in here because that is what we are a function of. It's a of t. So this means that for our specific scenario here with our $500 invested at this rate compounded monthly, our amount that we have after t years will be whatever we output. So number two is asking us how much is in the account after five years. So it's asking us to find what is a of five. So we will need our calculator to find a of 5. So that means I'm going to plug 5 in. It's going to have 500 plus 1 plus this fun decimal here to the 12 times 5 power. So that's 60th power there. So I'm going to put that all in my calculator just like it is and see what we get. We end up getting 519.099. So let's round. So A of 5 is approximately, and it's a dollar amount, so it's 519.09. So I'm going to round that to 0.10. So after five years, we have earned approximately $19.10 in interest, bringing our total amount to $519.10. And all we did was plug in five into our account. Number three is asking, how long will it take for the initial investment to double? Basically, how long until we can get twice $500? So we want to know how long does it take to get $1,000? We are looking for a time. So we're looking for T in this case. We're not plugging in a T because it says how long. So we want our output to be 1,000. So we want to know what's the T value to make A of T 1,000? So we still have the 500 here. We have 1 plus 0 0.0075 over 12 raised to the 12 times t. We need to solve for t. Our first step here is to divide by 500. If we do that, this side will end up being 2, and this side will just end up being our 1 plus 0 0.0075 over 12 raised to the 12t. We have an exponential equation that we need to solve. The way that we can do this is take the natural log of both sides to bring that uh, variable up in our exponent down. So I took the natural log of both sides. Then we can use the power property of logarithms to bring this 12t out front. That's the reason that we do this. So we still have the natural log of 2 equals 12t 
times the natural log, and then I'm going to just figure out what this is in my calculator real quick because we do not need to keep writing this in such a crazy way. So we can figure out what this is as a decimal. All right, plugging that in, I got one plus this fraction equals 1.000625. Now the next thing I want to do is get the 12 and this natural log of this guy um, away from the t since we want to solve for t. So in one step I'm going to divide by 12 times this natural log. Doing this in my calculator and making sure again that I had parentheses, or actually I need to put two parentheses. One closes the natural log, the other one closes this whole thing. So when I did this in my calculator, I got 92.44. And can we round that second four up? Yes, we can, because it was 0.448. So almost 92 and a half years. That is a long time. That's because this interest rate is not high at all. It's only 0.75%. So it's going to take a long time to double your money just in some sort of savings account. That is why things like stocks or CDs or mutual funds, things like that are going to most likely be able to accrue more money in a quicker way. Uh, but a savings account with a very low interest rate is going to take a very, very long time to just double from $500 to 1000 And then number four is asking us to find and interpret the average rate of change of the amount in our account from the end of the fourth year to the fifth year. It also says from the 34th year to the 35th year, but let's just do the first part here for sake of time. So remember average rate of change between two points is just their slope. It's y minus y over x minus x. So this is asking for the average rate of change between the fourth year and the fifth year. So our average rate of change is the amount from the fifth year minus the amount from the fourth year all over 5 minus 4. Again, y minus y, so the amount minus the amount from years 5 and 4 minus or divided by 5 minus 4. Glorified slope formula. We know what a of 5 is. We found it in number 2. So a of 5 is 519.10. Then a of 4 is going to be found in the exact same way that we found a of 5, except we just plug a 4 in here instead of a 5. So I'm going to do that, and then we'll divide by just 1. For a of 4, I got 515.22. So subtracting these two will yield $3.88. Now what does this mean? This means that the value of our investment is changing, and in this case increasing because it's positive, at about $3.88 during this year from the fourth to the fifth year. It does change, like if we were to find the rate of change between the 34th and the 35th year, it would be much higher. Um, that is because the more money you have in your account, the more interest you're earning. And so the gap between year to year increases. So we could say because it is a rate of change, it is how our uh, amount in our account, or our investment rather, is changing from years four to five. Technically, because it's positive, we could also say it's increasing at that rate. Previously, we talked about compounding 12 times a year, but what if we could compound way more than that per year? What if we kept compounding 100 times per year, 1,000 times per year, so much so that the amount of times that we compounded approached infinity? That's when we get continuously compound interest, and that's when we get to E. Let's see why this is. Here is our compound interest formula. And right now I'm just going to show why we get this formula here. If you are not interested in that, please move ahead. But I am just going to show kind of a quick proof of why we get E. It's really neat. So let's say we have a principal amount of just one. Keep it simple. And let's say our rate is 100%. Again, just for the simplicity aspect. So R would be one. If our rate was 100%, as a decimal, it would be one. And then t is one year, so we're multiplying just n times one. Let's show that as n, the number of times that we compound approaches infinity. Let's show that, see what a approaches, rather. So n can be 1, 12, right, monthly, and then let's increase n to 100, 
1,000, and then 10,000, and see what A approaches. What I'm going to do actually in my calculator is put this, we don't even need this one out in front here. So I'm just going to put this into my calculator. You could also put it into Desmos, and N is X then in your calculator or Desmos, and then we'll see what our outputs end up being. So I put these values into Desmos and we have this here instead of N I put X and actually included a few more. But as you can see what happens as when X is 1 this is just 2 but as we increase our N value towards infinity our output approaches 2.718, 2817 it goes on. This is E right here. And this is one of the reasons that E is so important. E is defined as N approaches infinity of this value right here. So basically, we approach E. This is why continuously compound interest has a base of E. Here in the second example, we're actually going to do the exact same thing as the first example, except instead of being compounded monthly, it's going to be compounded continuously we'll be able to compare how different that initial $500 is treated being compounded um, 12 times per year as opposed to an infinite amount of times per year. So we are going to actually use a different formula here, the one that we just learned for number one, because we're now being compounded continuously rather than monthly where n is 12. So we'll have a of t, and then our formula is p times e to the rt. I always thought of this as pert when I learned it, so that helped me remember it because it spells pert. And plugging in our values, we again have our principal amount is 500. Our base is e because we're being continuously compounded. Our rate is going to be this 0 .0, um, sorry, 0.75% as a decimal, which again is 0 0.0075, then then times t. So this is our general formula for this situation. Then number two, once again, is asking us how much is in our account after five years. So again, we're just plugging in five into the function. It's nothing too crazy. You definitely want to use your calculator here, or you can use Desmos. So here, we're going to get something very similar to what we had last time. Here we have 519, but instead of just point. 10, it's 0 0.105, so we can round up. Previously, we rounded up also. So we saw that in our first example, being compounded monthly after five years, we had $519.10. Compounded continuously adds on one cent. Doesn't seem like too much, and it's definitely not, but over time and with a higher interest rate, it can differ a little bit more. All right, let's see how long it'll take for that initial investment to double. So we want to know how long is it going to take, or what's the T value, to get from that $500 to $1,000. So we want to know when is A of T going to equal $1,000, and we're looking for T here. So I'm going to first divide both sides by 500 to keep this much simpler. If we do that, we'll just have the nice number of 2, and then e with no coefficient in front of it, so it makes it easier. Then we can take the natural log of both sides, so we'll have the natural log of 2 equals the natural log of e to the 0 0.0075t. Using the power property, we're going to bring down that decimal, so 0 0.0075t, times the natural log of e, which is just 1. We then are going to divide both sides by 0 0.0075, and we can use our calculator to see what the outcome will be. Remember before, it took 92.45 years for us to get that $1,000 when we were compounded monthly. Let's see how long it'll take when we're compounded continuously. When we do this division, we'll have t is approximately 92 Point four two years. So we cut off a whole 0 0.03 years here for our initial investment to double. Basically, compounding monthly is very good. Even 12 times per year is almost, is basically comparable to compounding continuously, which is what we're learning from this here, comparing the two. Then we want to find the average rate of change, once again, between the fourth year and the fifth year. 
Finding that average rate of change, we already found a of 5 in number 2. I found a of 4 by simply plugging 4 in to the a of t function. This is a little bit, only I think 1 cent off from before. Then we'll divide that by 1. And once again, we have $3.88. And interpreting this rate of change is this is how our investment is changing between years four and five. Because it's positive, we're increasing at a rate of $3.88 per year at that time. This next example is, again, using the compound continuous uh, interest formula. It's asking us how much money needs to be invested to obtain $2,000 in three years. Um, and we're given, again, a low interest rate of 0.25%. So we basically want to know what does our principal need to be if in three years we want $2,000 at this interest rate compounded continuously. The first thing that I would do is just write out the formula that we need. It's the A of T equals PERT, P times E to the RT. PERT is compounded continuously. Then we just want to plug in. So we're looking for A of T which you can write it as A of T or you can just write it as A. It might be simpler just to write it as A equals, rather. So we know that we want A to be 2,000. I'm just going left to right here. P, we want to know what the principal amount is, so that's what we're looking for. Then E is just E. Um, R is the rate, so since it's 0.25%, we got to move the decimal, so it's 0 0.0025 as the decimal then time is three years. So this is all the stuff we've been told. So I'm just going to plug it right in. So we're going to have 2,000 equals P times E to the point 0, 0, 0.0025 times 3. Now in this case, there's no taking the log of both sides or anything like that. And that's because we're not trying to solve for something that's up in the uh, exponent. We're looking for P e to the point zero zero two five times 3 is just a number. So e is just a number, and then e to that exponent is just a number. So getting this in real time, we have 2,000 equals p times, and this whole thing here is 1.0075. Then I want to divide both sides by that. And when we divide both sides by that, we get P equals 1985.11. So this is a, a, like a monetary amount, so I always give two decimal points just because that's how we write money. So it looks like that if in three years we want to get up to two grand, we need to put in only about $15 less than that. Again, that's because this is a pretty low interest rate, but this is pretty standard. Like, I think this is what the one in my savings account is currently. Your next formula is about growth. So we have graduated from the interest formulas, and now we're headed into growth and decay. So uninhibited growth just means that you can keep growing forever. You're not, like, being stopped by anything, like something in the wild is not eating your population and it's not leveling off. So uninhibited growth is just that. Uh, and this is called the law of uninhibited growth. The number of organisms n at any time t is given by this formula. So n sub 0, which is read n naught or just n sub 0, is your initial amount that you have. n sub 0, that 0 means at time 0. So that's your initial amount of whatever animals you're talking about. And it's uninhibited, so it's e raised to the kt. This looks very similar to pert, and it's the same idea. But instead of money and a rate, uh, an interest rate rather, we have an original or initial amount of animals or organisms, and k, which is our constant of proportionality, um, and k needs to be greater than zero. That's because it's growth. So basically, this is what these three values boil down to. This example here is about the law of uninhibited growth, and it's saying we have a certain strain of E. coli, so some bacteria, and it's being modeled using this law right here. Again, it's telling us N sub 0 is the initial number of bacteria, 
t is the elapsed time, which is in this case measured in minutes. From numerous experiments, it's been determined that the doubling time of this organism is 20 minutes. That is quite remarkable. And then we suppose 1,000 bacteria are present initially. Our first task is to find our growth constant, k. Before we do this, let's write out what we know. We know that when t is 0, we know that n sub 0 is 1,000. So that's when t is 0. That's kind of overkill to say it this way. n sub 0, like we know that means when t is 0, but I just want us to understand that's what that means. Then it tells us that the doubling time is 20 minutes. So that means that it takes 20 minutes for us to double our amount. So after 20 minutes, our n value now is doubled. So it's 2,000. So that is information that we were sort of given in a hidden way. Do we, are we given anything else? It doesn't look like it. This should be enough information for us to find k. So let's do that for part a. I wrote out the formula, so I know that I can plug in 1,000 here for n sub 0, and I can't really plug in anything else yet. That's our, our function. However, we need to find k. The way that we're going to find k is use the fact that when t is 20, n is 2,000, and then we're going to solve for k. So we can plug in in this next step here using this right here. So I'm going to know that n is 2,000. And then we also know that t is 20. So we need to solve for k. k is up in the exponent, so I do want to take the natural log of both sides here. But before I do that, I'm going to divide by 1,000 on both sides. Doing that again will yield 2. 2 is a common number that we're taking the natural log of with a lot of these application problems because a lot of times we care about half-life or doubling, and 2 is just a common number that we see with exponential functions. So now we can take the natural log of both sides in order to solve for k. When we do that, we'll have the natural log of 2 equals the natural log of e to the 20k, bringing down that 20k and multiplying by the natural log of e, which is just 1, gives us ln2 equals 20k. We divide both sides by 20, and then we get a decimal of 0.03465. It does say to round to four decimal places, so we'll have 0 0.0347. Now since we know k, we can answer part b. Part b is asking us to find the overall function n of t. So n of t equals n sub 0, or n naught, which is 1,000, times e to the kt. Now that we know k, we can plug it into our function. It's 0 0.0347 times t. So this is our function because we know n sub 0 and we know k, the two important parts of our function for this particular situation. In part c, we're asked how long until there are 9,000 bacteria. So in this case, we're looking for t. Oh, it even says round your answer to the nearest minute. So that's telling us what is t. Um, so we want to know how long does it take until n of t is 9,000. So we'll plug in 9,000 here and the rest of our function, and then we want to solve for t. We'll divide both sides by 1,000 to keep it simpler. I highly recommend doing that. 0347t. Then once again, this is very similar to part a to solve. We want to take the natural log of both sides. When we take the natural log of e raised to that power, our power property says we can bring the power out front and multiply by the natural log of e, which is just 1. Then we'll divide both sides by 0 0.0347 in order to find t. So solving for t, we'll have t is 63.32 to the nearest minute. That is 63 minutes. So it'll take just a little bit over an hour for the bacteria to be 9 times the initial amount of 1,000. Our next formula is radioactive decay or exponential decay. This is the exact same formula as before, except your book decides to delineate between n and a. 
it's ex it's basically the same thing. So a sub zero is the initial amount. In this case of an isotope, this is a very chemistry heavy type of formula. Then again, k is the constant of proportionality. Um, in this case, we can just say k is the decay rate or the constant of proportionality, they mean the same thing. But please note that k was greater than zero when we had growth, and k is less than zero when we have decay. So that's basically the only difference. And once again, t is time. Time could be uh, measured in anything, seconds, minutes, years, billions of years, it just depends. So let's take a look at a problem that is chemistry heavy. We have an isotope, uh, cobalt 60 it's used with food and the initial amount is 50 grams and it has a half-life of 5.27 years now you probably have learned about half-life in chemistry but if you haven't a half-life is how long it takes um, for half of the Im initial amount to be left so if the initial amount in this case is 50 after 5.27 years we'll have 25 grams left and then in another 5.27 years, we'll have 12.5 grams left. So it keeps halving. So again, in part A, we want to find the decay constant. But just like in our previous example, we know some information that we should write down. So we know that, actually, let's write this out real quick. Oops, K, T. All right, we have that written down. What we know is that A sub 0, our initial amount, is 50 and then we also know after 5.27 years so after t is when t is 5.27 we know that a is 25 because of the idea of half-life so we can use this given information it was given but sort of hidden to find the decay constant k so in part A, I'm going to write out our formula and plug in A sub 0, which is 50. Then we can use this information here in order to find K. So we'll plug in 5.27 for T, and we'll plug in 25 for A. So we'll have K times 5.27. Now in this case, we're going to divide both sides by 50 to keep it easy. When we divide both sides by 50, we get one half rather than two. That's because this is a half-life problem, so we're gonna be dealing with half rather than doubling like we did before. Here we wanna take the natural log of both sides. When we do that, on this side we'll be left with just 5.27k times the natural log of e, which is just one. Dividing both sides by 5.27 will give us our k value. Now remember, because we are decaying, k is less than zero. It's a negative number, and it does happen to be that. It's 0 0.13152, and rounding to four decimal places, um, that five will just stay the same because the two after it was less than five. So then part B is having us actually write out what our function is. We know our initial amount was 50, and now we know what k is. k is negative 0. 1315t. So this is our function that we can use. Then in part C, we want to figure out how long it takes for 90% of the material to decay. And then they provide us with a nice hint. If 90% of the material decays, how much is left? Well, 10% would, would be left. So what is 10% of 50 grams? 10% of 50 is just 5. So basically, this question is asking us, how long does it take for only 5 grams to remain? So we basically want to just plug in 5 for A of T, and then solve for T, because it's asking us how long will that take. All right, we're going to divide both sides by 50, and take a look at what we got. We got 1 tenth, or 10%. So it's basically, it's a nice little like reminder that we're doing this correctly. Then once again, we'll take the natural log of both sides. And again, we're left with just that exponent over there. When we divide uh, both sides 
by this coefficient here, our k value, we end up getting 17.5. And it says round your answer to two decimal places, so I gotta keep going. So 17.51, and that is in years. So it takes 17 and a half years for 90% of our material to decay. Our next formula is Newton's law of cooling, which essentially is an object warming. Um, we have temperature based of time, so T of T, and this is the rest that we have here. T sub A is the ambient temperature, which is the room temperature. And then T sub zero is the initial temperature. So in here we have initial temperature minus the room temperature times E raised to the negative KT. And again, K is our constant of proportionality. Basically, these are the three things that we care about. It says ambient temperature, which means room temperature, essentially. In our example, we have a pork roast. It was taken out of a smoker, and it had an internal temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Then it was allowed to rest in a 75 degree house for 20 minutes and then its eternal temperature had dropped down to 170. So we dropped 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we are, of course, adhering to Newton's law of cooling. We want to express the temperature as a function of time. So that's the first thing that we want to do. So I'm going to write out what the formula looks like. So here is our function and we need to plug in some things. So we need to figure out what T sub A is, T sub zero, and then K. Let's figure out what we know so far. We basically know that T sub zero, our initial temperature of the pork roast was 180. Then we know that T sub A, the ambient or room temperature is 75. Then we also know that when T was 20 minutes, our big T dropped down to 170. So we can use that to help us find K. So again, this is given info right here. So let's plug in what we know so far. T sub A is 75. Then when we subtract these, 180 minus 75 in here will give us 105. And then it's times E to the negative KT. Now next what I'm going to do to solve for K is I'm going to plug in this piece of information right here. So we know that if t was 20, little t rather was 20, our big t was 170. And that's going to help us find k, which of course we need for our function. Solving for k, I'm first going to subtract 75 from both sides. So we'll get 95 equals 105e to the negative 20k. Then to keep it simple, I'm going to divide both sides by 105. So doing this, I realized, gave me a crazy long decimal, so I'm just going to keep it as a fraction on this side. Again, the reason I did that is so when I take the natural log of this side, I don't have unnecessary issues over here with this coefficient. So now we can take the natural log of both sides. When we do that, we'll have the natural log of this fraction equals negative 20k times the natural log of e. Then we'll divide both sides by negative 20. We end up getting k equals 0 0.005. So our function, this was all for part a, is this right here, but plugging in k since we had to find k. So we have 75 plus 105 e to the negative 0 0.005 times little t. So this is our function for our particular situation. Then part b is asking us, find the time at which the roast would have dropped to 140 had it not been carved and eaten. So how long would it have taken for it to drop 40 total degrees? So basically we want to plug in 140 for our output temperature and then find t, the time. So we're using our formula again to find t. The first thing we want to do is subtract 75 from both sides and then divide by 105. 
So when we subtract, we get 65, and then we'll divide by 105 on both sides. So we'll have 65 over 105 equals e to the negative 0.005t. We take the natural log of both sides. Yes, this fraction and the one in the previous part could have been simplified, but that's fine. So when we take the natural log of e to the negative 0.005t, we can use the power property to bring that exponent down times the natural log of e, which is just 1. Dividing both sides by negative 0.005t gives us 95.9 for t. So that means, what does that mean for us? That means it would take about an hour and almost 36 minutes for that pork roast to have dropped down to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is how we can use Newton's law of cooling to tell us how much an object cools over time. Our very last formula, we finally made it to the last one, is logistic growth. We previously learned about uninhibited growth, which literally was uninhibited. It was not hindered by anything. This is hindered by something. Um, we do have a limiting population, L. So this is, again, an exponential equation, but we have a lot more variables here. So C is how much room there is to grow. It's just some sort of constant in here. L is our limiting population. It's the numerator. Again, N sub 0 uh, is not necessarily written here, but we're going to use that idea of initial population to help us find these other variables. And in order to find C, we can use this equation right here with n sub 0. So just be sure that you have this and this written down. Know that L is the limiting population. C is just a constant. Um, K, again, is a growth rate. And T is time. These logistic growth uh, formulas are most notably used for how something spreads such as like a disease or the flu and then also like a rumor so a rumor is kind of a fun way that we can talk about this logistic growth function um, so we have the number of people n in hundreds at a local school who have heard a certain rumor can be modeled using this logistic equation t is greater than or equal to zero because t is the number of days after April 1st, 2009. So it looks like April Fool's Day. Your book has a really good sense of humor. All right, let's look at number one. We want to find and interpret n of zero. All I did is plug in zero for t. So when we do that, we can't have negative zero here. So we simply have this right here. Now e to the zero is just one because anything to the zero is one. So this is one plus 2799, which is 2800. So we have 84 over 2800. And then simplifying that will give us 0 0.03. Now that doesn't make sense like if it was just 0 0.03 people, but remember that n is in hundreds of people. So multiplying this by 100 will tell us how many people. So 0 0.03 times 100, because it's in hundreds, is 3, moving the decimal point over twice. So that means 3 people. So what does this mean? That means on the very first day, or the initial amount of people rather, were 3 people have heard the rumor or basically started the rumor. So initially, three people heard or most likely started this rumor. Then we want to find and interpret the n behavior of n of t. The n behavior can most easily be found by looking at a graph or looking at the table of our graph. So let's do that. Let's bring this up in Desmos and see what happens when t approaches infinity. Looking at our graph on Desmos... We can clearly see that this is a funky looking function, but it increases pretty steeply from the beginning days. And then once our days get more and more, so as t, the number of days, approaches infinity, in this case t is x, um, it looks like we do level off at some value. So let's see what that value is using our table. 
So we can plug in very large values for x, which is t. So we can start by plugging in a couple different values, such as like 10. So after 10 days, then we can say after 20 days, then we can say after 30 days, and so on. So it looks like we're already approaching the number 84. So we'll do 25 days, so we can see that a little bit better. 30 days, okay, uh, 130, whatever. So as t gets very big, in this case x, we're approaching 84. Now this value right here is not technically 84, it's just rounding to it because 84 is what we approach. Um, so we can see that our n behavior as t goes to infinity, our function n of t approaches 84. So we want to interpret this. We know that as t approaches infinity, our n behavior n of t, it approaches 84. Then interpreting this, we don't just want to say the amount of people who hear the rumor approaches 84 people. Remember that this is measured in hundreds. So the amount of people who hear the rumor approaches 8,400 people, which is 8,400 people. Now let's think about why that is. It most likely is because that might be how many people are actually at the community college, and that's basically the limiting capacity here. So that's at max how many people could essentially hear this rumor. Now we want to know how long does it take until 4,200 people hear the rumor. So we want to basically plug in, not 4,200, but just 42 because it's in hundreds. So we want to plug in 42 for n of t and solve for t. So we'll have 42 equals 84 over 1 plus 2799e to the negative t. Then what we can do is multiply uh, both sides by our denominator. Once we've done that, you can distribute the 42 through, or you can divide both sides by 42. If you divide both sides by 42, it works out quite nicely, because 84 divided by 42 is just 2. We can then subtract 1 from both sides and divide by 2799. When we do this, we can then take the natural log of both sides. So the natural log of e to the negative t using the power property, we can bring down that exponent, multiply by the natural log of t, which is just 1. Take the natural log of 1 over 2799. Then to solve for t, we can divide both sides by that negative 1 that's in front of the t. When we do this, we will get approximately 7.937, so 7.94. And this is in days. You can always take a look at your graph to make sure that if you plug in 7.94, you get an output of 42. Congratulations on making it through that whole thing. I know that was a ton and a lot to get through. But the, the moral of the story is whatever function you're using, just make sure you understand what each variable means and that you're writing down the function correctly. A lot of them are used in the exact same way. We want to take the natural log of both sides to solve. Good luck.